My name is Mitch Yell. I'm from the University of South Carolina. And uh, what I'm going to be doing the webinar today on is developing educationally meaningful and legally sound IEPs, avoiding errors in the IEP process. And uh, obviously, this is a very important uh, area uh, because probably 80 to 85 percent of all due process hearings in special, heard in special education involve issues of what is called free appropriate public education. And the IEP is the blueprint of, of a child's free appropriate public education. So it's very important that we know, understand what the major errors that are made by school districts are and how we can avoid making those errors. Now, the IEP itself, um, there we go. OK, the IEP itself is a central part of, of the idea. This is a quotation from uh, Robert Stafford, a, s a senator, one of the original sponsors of the then Education for All Handicapped Children Act. Um, he said that the IEP was a central part of the law as they wrote it and intended it to be carried out. Um, and it is. In many ways, it is a child's free, appropriate public education. Now, the promise of the IEP when it was originally developed and is currently uh, is it is the instrument developed to ensure a child's free, appropriate public education. And we'll talk about this in a little while, what exactly that means. But that is essentially what states must do in offering special education programs to youngsters with disabilities who are serviced under the idea. They have to be provided a free, appropriate public education. And that essentially means they have to be provided with special education and related services that are reasonably calculated to provide meaningful educational benefit. Now, in the IEP, in many ways, is similar to a contract. There are certainly similarities to contractual obligations in terms of what the IEP says it will provide. Uh, all those services that we write in the IEP and that we must make good fa faith efforts to uh, meet those promises that we make. But it's not an actual guarantee of success. But nonetheless, it is in many ways, as I said, said similar to a contractual obligation that you have with the child, the child's parents for whom the IEP covers. Now, why is avoiding IEPs important? Well, as I said before, the student's IEP is the blueprint of his or her free appropriate public education or FAPE. And an IEP that is procedurally and substantively correct ensures that a student will receive an education that confers meaningful educational benefit. Now, and I'll explain those terms in a little while, but a procedurally and substantively uh, correct IEP will ensure that a child, that a school district does provide FAPE. Now, uh, as we go through the webinar, I'll be talking about f four different uh, components in the IEP process. And I just want to explain those real briefly. Of course, they are assessment, programming, monitoring progress, and placement. Uh, those are major parts of the IEP. Of course, the IEP is quite a complex document, but those are really the major parts. Now, the placement is often does not have to actually be part of the IEP process, but it often is. So many of the errors that we're going to see in IEP development uh, stem from these four areas. Now, free appropriate public education, that is the promise that was made in way back in 1975 in the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. The name was changed, of course, in 1990 to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. But the promise was that for all students who are eligible, all students with disabilities eligible under the law, is that the state would provide, any school district would, would provide them with special education and related services, which were 
to be were uh, provided at public expense, would meet the state educational agency standards, and that would be uh, provided in conformity with a child's individualized education program. So, and as I mentioned before, approximately 85, possibly more percent of all percent of all uh, due process hearings are revolve around the issue of is a child receiving a FAPE or free appropriate public education. That is why the IEP is so incredibly important in avoiding years, is especially important. Now, I want to spend a little time talking about, um, oops, the, uh, the, the test, the route, what, is, what has been called the Rowley test. Um, and should come up in your, on your screen in a few seconds here. Uh, Rowley, the Rowley test came from a, a Supreme Court case, actually the first Supreme Court case heard um, in, on special education. And it was a case that involved free appropriate public education or FAPE. And the case involved a young girl by the name of Amy Rowley who was deaf and hard of hearing and the school district um, had proposed an IEP, which the parents agreed with most part, but with one part they disagreed with it. And the upshot is, to make a long story short, what happened is the case went from a due process, well, it went from the IEP process in the local school to a due process hearing, uh, to a district court, to a, a circuit court, and finally ended up in the Supreme Court of the United States. And this was at the time, and certainly and probably still is, the most important case heard in special education. Well, in that particular case, the, the Rowley court defined a free appropriate public education because that was the issues that they had to deal with. And they said essentially that a school district can meet the requirements of the law of the idea and in other words, provide a FAPE for children with dis students with disabilities if they uh, do essentially two major things. They have to comply with the procedure set forth in the IDEA, again, then the EAHCA. And the second thing is, once they comply with these procedures, they have to develop an IEP that allows the student or confers upon the student what has been called Educa meaningful educational benefit. So, in other words, the Supreme Court said any time there's a due process hearing, there's a court case on a FAPE issue or free appropriate public education issue, what a court or a hearing officer has to do is first look at the procedure set forth in the law and determine if the school's school has met those procedures. Uh, if they have, then they look on to the sec they look to the second part of the Rowley test, wh which is was the IEP that was written for the student reasonably calculated to enable the student to achieve educational benefit? So again, you can see how important the IEP is. Now uh, there are you can see there are two different sets of requirements here. The first, the Supreme Court called the procedural requirements. Procedural requirements require that as teachers, as administrators, that we know what the law requires us to do in developing a child's IEP and fulfill those requirements. Now, there are four major categories of procedures that we have to uh, uh, follow. And the first is, and perhaps the most important of all, is parents have to be involved in a meaningful way, what we call full and meaningful parental involvement. A second per category of procedures is around, uh, occurs around the identification evaluation requirements of the IEP. A third set of procedures is how we develop the IEP. And a fourth set of procedures is in the placement uh, that we make. There are certain procedures that we have to follow in all four categories. And we have to make certain that we follow these very closely. And that's what the Supreme Court was saying. That's the first prong of the Rowley test. 
did the school district follow the procedures appropriately? Now, in 19, uh, in, excuse me, in 2004, the law really started changing because, as you all are aware, the the law is um, was passed originally in 1975. It's reauthorized about every five to six years, sometimes four years. Reauthorization is a process when Congress goes into the law and essentially uh, refunds the law. Well, most of our law. Uh, is permanent. It won't go away unless it would be repealed or um, amended in some way. But part of the law requires that Congress goes back and refunds it. And that's what they do every four or five years. So they did a reauthorization in 1980, 1986, 1990, 1997, and 2004. In fact, they're even starting a reauthorization process right now. Well, in 2000, actually starting in 1997, the the kind of the major push or the major gist of the idea started changing. When the law was first passed in 1975, it was really more about um, access, making certain children with disabilities had access to education. In 1997, it started to change. Uh, because the battle for access was won, children do with disabilities do have access. Now the emphasis has become more on quality of programming and on accountability. Well, in 2004, Congress uh, emphasizing the fact that the substantive or the quality of, of an IEP is, is of extreme importance, kind of said, basically said that there are only some procedures that will result in a denial of FAPE and thus a violation of the idea. And that is when a school district makes procedural errors that one, impede a student's right to receive a free appropriate public education. Two, impede the parent's right to, meet, to be meaningfully involved in special education. Or three, cause a deprivation of educational benefits. Now, so the procedural errors that I'm going to be talking about really revolve around those four particular areas. And some of them we'll go through relatively quickly, and some of them we'll spend a little more time on. The top procedural errors that we see school districts make that can lead to a violation of the idea are the following. Failing to obtain parental consent, failing to ensure a parent's meaningful participation in the IEP process, improper IEP team membership, predetermining IEP services and placement, failing to ensure a continuum of alternative placements, and failing to address transition needs and services. Now we're going to go through these just real fairly quickly, and some of them I'll spend more time on than others. But the first error I want to talk about is failing to obtain parental consent. A couple important things about that. Um, one is consent always means informed consent, according to the 2006 regulations. We have to ensure that we have informed consent before we evaluate a child or assess a child for placement, before we uh, place a child in special education, uh, before we do a reevaluation. There's a number of, of times when we do need parental consent. And very important, and usually not, not one would think not an, error, not an area where there would be a lot of errors made. But unfortunately, it does happen that uh, parental consent is a school district fails to obtain parental consent. And that can lead to uh, certainly to legal problems. Now, um, oftentimes, in districts, we have problems obtaining parental consent. And that is OK as long as we can still go ahead and uh, place a child or do an evaluation as long as we do have parental consent. And if you've made reasonable efforts to obtain parental consent or parents' informed consent, and you just can't get a hold of them, or you can't locate them, or maybe they refuse to participate, um, 
not but don't actively say no, you can't do that, you can go ahead and um, go do the assessment, uh, do the IEP, as long as you keep records of all attempts to contact parents, such as keeping detailed record of telephone calls made or attempted and any results, copies of correspondence, uh, detailed records of visits uh, made to a parent's home or place of employment. So in essence, what we have to do is ensure that all information for which consent is sought is fully described in the written form or through discussion with the parents, preferably both, document all efforts we make to obtain consent. If there are any disputes or misunderstood issues involving informed consent, that should be discussed at the IEP. And we need to make sure that parents understand that they can uh, revoke consent. And now, as I said, usually consent is not a problem. School districts are very aware of when they need to get consent and generally tend to do a very good job in that area. Nonetheless, um, it's very important that we attend closely to when consent is required and make certain we do have a written consent. Now, second error is, and this is certainly the major error that school districts make. Um, and that is failing to ensure parents' meaningful participation in the IEP process. Um, by the way, we just had a comment from Travis. Will we be able to get a, a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? And yes, uh, that will be put on the website. That will be put, it'll be put on the website. OK, so this is the second major error, failing to ensure that parents have a meaningful role in the IEP process. Now, um, the idea of regulations essentially say that parental participation in the special education process, uh, decision making process, is so important that it's one of two procedural grounds for finding that an LEA has denied a student a free appropriate public education with respect to involving parents. So very, very important. This is certainly the key procedural safeguard of the idea. And it requires that school district personnel cooperate with and strongly encourage parents to be involved in all steps of the development of a child's IEP, from the assessment to the IEP development to the placement. Parents must have them play a meaningful role. And essentially, the law uses the term equal participants along with school personnel in developing, reviewing, and revising the IEP. So not only is it important that parents be involved at all steps of this process, it's also extremely important that this process is meaningful, that parents have the opportunity um, to discuss issues, have their opinions heard, um, Parents need to understand what is going to be discussed at the IEP, what is going on during the meeting, what is being proposed, any opinions, any suggestions they have uh, must be given serious consideration by the IEP team. Additionally, one or both of the child's parents should be present at the IEP meeting unless, I said, it's we are unable to contact uh, a child's parents, or they just refuse to come. But if we, if that's the issue, if that's the case, we can go ahead and, and write the IEP. But we have to really be careful about documenting efforts at securing parental involvement and documenting that those efforts have been unsuccessful. Also, parents must be notified early enough to ensure they have an opportunity to attend um, the IEP meeting the placement meeting, and the IEP meeting, as we know, must be scheduled at a mutually agree, agreed upon time and place. And I mentioned this before, but we may proceed without parents, but a meeting may only be held without a student's parents only when the LEA is unable to convince the parent to attend, uh, and in such in, uh, situations, 
I have to stress that you must keep a good record of all your attempts uh, to arrange a mutually agreeable time and place. So strategies to ensure that we comply with this very, very important procedural safeguard. Be flexible in schedule meetings. Be flexible when you schedule your IEP meetings, your assessment meetings. Certainly uh, take the parents' uh, schedules into account when doing that. Give them enough time. Encourage parental involvement in the IEP process. And I know a number of school districts um, take steps such as um, having counselors working with parents um, to, before the IEP meeting to let them know what's going to be happening, uh, how important it is that they be involved. Uh, it's also a good idea for uh, school district personnel to keep careful written notes at the IEP meeting and including parental contributions and the team's considerations of those um, contributions and even reviewing the notes at the end of the meeting is a good idea. And if an IEP team elects to meet without parents um, because they were unable to convince them to attend, you need to be ready to defend your action with thorough documentation. Now, for the and, uh, someone brought this up already, but it's very, very important that the initial IEP meeting, the parents are, are available, or the parents are at that meeting. Um, it's not as much a problem at subsequent meetings if you go ahead and, and hold it, as long as, of course, they've consented to it. And uh, again, you have that documentation. Now, let's go on to the third uh, major error that school districts make, a procedural error, and that is having improper IEP team membership. Now, I think there was a, uh, a case a number of years ago in New York uh, that put this very well. They said an IEP prepared by an invalidly composed IEP team is a nullity. In other words, it is not valid if you write an IEP that does not uh, include, it is not written or developed by a properly composed IEP team. Now, this, of course, we all know is the uh, participants who are supposed to be on the IEP team. It includes the parents, a representative of the local educational agency or the school district. And this person must be um, able to either supervise the provision of special education or actually provide special education. Initially, they have to be knowledgeable about the general education curriculum and the school district's resources. The next point, the next, the next is the general education teacher. Now, this is an interesting change in 2004. And I put it in quotes. Now the general ed teacher, according to the law, must be the general education teacher of such child, which has been interpreted uh, by the Department of Education as meaning you have to have a general education teacher there who works with the child, who works with the student, or has worked with the student. Um, only one in the case of having multiple teachers. Uh, you, still, you would really only need to have one. But it really needs to be the child's teacher. Next, we have the special education teacher. Again, it says of such child. So that would be the teacher who works directly, the special ed teacher who's working directly with the child and involved in the, will be involved in the IEP. The fourth person is a person knowledgeable about assessment. Uh, I should say the instructional implications of the assessment or evaluation. Now, interestingly enough, this person can be one of the other members of the <coughs> excuse me, team. Could be the uh, LEA rep. It could be the special ed teacher. It doesn't have to be a separate member. But whoever it is, they have to understand what the instructional implications of the evaluation or assessment results were. Uh, many school districts may use school psychologists uh, in this role, and that's certainly acceptable. It doesn't have to be. Uh, others at request of the IEP team participants. 
And um, whenever appropriate, of course, this is very appropriate when the transition is being discussed, the student needs to be in the IEP team. Now, in 2004, Congress, in an attempt to make it easier, uh, more convenient, did say that IEP team members could be excused. Article 7 also includes this. And it says, excusal of IEP team members is allowable if the LEA and the parents agree that the member's attendance is not required because the area is not being discussed or modified. So also, the member's area, if the member's area is being discussed, but the member and the member is not able to um, make, the, make the meeting, they must submit a written report prior to the meeting. And of course, parents must give informed consent to any excusal. Now, strategies to in, ensure compliance with this um, allow parents to bring persons to the meeting who have knowledge or special expertise regarding their child. You could include related service providers and others who will be involved in the child's programming. A good idea. But be very careful to avoid routine use of the excusal process. Um, this is not something we want to do very frequently. That is to say, you know, get the parents' permission to have a, a member excused. It's also very important that we understand the role of the general education teacher. That in now the general ed education teacher, according to law, should be the child's teacher. And they need to be involved in a meaningful way, too. And um, they also need to be kind of the conduit to general education that if there are any modifications to general education or supplementary aids and services, the general education teacher is the one who is uh, responsible for those to make, to make certain. Of course, we're all responsible. But they sh can m help to make certain that other teachers in general education understand what they are to do with respect to any program modifications. And of course, when transition services are being discussed, Ensure that the student is on the IEP team. Now, brings us to the fifth major error, and that is predetermining IEP services and placement. Now, I said that the second major error I talked about, which was in parental involvement, not having the parents meaningfully involved in the IEP process, is, very, is related to this. But nonetheless, I decided to do it as a separate one because we're seeing more and more due process hearings on this very issue. And it's very important. Um, it's, a, it's very important that schools do not make this error because if you're if it's if you predetermine IEP services replacement, that is almost a, a that's a very likely uh, violation of the idea. Now, what exactly is predetermination? Well, predetermination is when the team essentially decides, the school-based team essentially decides the student's placement or program prior to the IEP meeting and without parental participation. Excluding parents from the, from the program or placement decisions certainly may constitute a denial of a free, appropriate public education. So, Going into IEP meetings with your mind made up, this is what we're going to do, is clearly a potential violation of the IDA. You don't want to do that. S definitive statements made during the IEP process, such as, no, we always do this, or we never place ch uh, youngsters with autism in this setting. Uh, any type of statements of definitive nature of that are very good evidence of predetermination. So extremely important that you avoid that. Now, the question always arises regarding predetermination is, are draft IEPs OK? Well, they are. Um, I've uh, been a teacher for many years. Um, 
and I would bring draft IEPs into meetings, and that's fine. You can prepare for a meeting as long as you don't predetermine. Um, you can have pre-meetings or preparatory activities uh, in which you discuss issues that will be raised at the IEP meeting, but you cannot come in with a final IEP. And it sounds like an, an issue that people would say, well, that seems to make common sense. You have to have the parents meaningfully involved. But as I said, there have been a number of cases in which school districts have lost, have lost because it was determined they did not provide FAPE and they violated the idea because they didn't, or the court or the hearing officer decided the school district had really made up their mind prior. And that really makes the whole issue of parental involvement a ruse, and that's why that's such a serious error. Now, I think a kind of an interesting um, statement made in a case in 1992 was that, and a very accurate statement made by the judge, was that school officials must come to the IEP table, table with an open mind, but this does not mean that they should come with a blank mind. In other words, it's fine to consider and have informal meetings and write a draft IEP, but make certain that parents know it's draft, that the meeting is where the actual IEP will be determined. And if you do bring a draft IEP, that could increase the risk of predetermination unless certain precautions are taken, taken such as writing draft on the top of the IEP, um, telling telling the parents that it is a draft, possibly uh, sending them a dra the draft IEP a few days beforehand so they have a chance to look at it. So draft IEPs are fine, but make certain that parents understand they are only drafts. Six here is failing to address transition needs and services. Um, not as common, I think, as, as errors of predetermination, but certainly errors that you want to watch out for. Uh, we need to begin the transition planning process with the first IEP after a ter student turns 13. So in other words, this IEP must be in place, according to Article 7, when the student is turns 14 years old. So it's a very good idea to begin the transition planning process when the child is 13 years old. Additionally, students should be included in the, in the transition planning. Identify the student's post-school goals using age-appropriate transition assessments. Inform parents about the goals of transition planning and the essential role that they play. And then when you're actually doing the transition process, discuss and document. I think taking notes is always a good idea. Beware generic transition plans, that any generic plan is going to be a problem if there is a due process hearing or a court case, because that looks like predetermination. It looks like lack of individualization. Now, those are the procedural errors. And as I said, in 2004, the Congress said in, in IDEA 2004 that there are only a few procedural errors. That doesn't mean we don't have to follow the procedures. It's very important we follow the procedures because when you look at most of the procedures, they're really to ensure parents are meaningfully involved. And if a procedural error is such that parents are not involved, that will certainly arise to a violation of faith and thus a violation of the IDEA. Now, the second major uh, types of requirements coming from the Rowley test that we have in developing students' IEPs are what, what are called the substantive requirements. If you remember, we talked about the, the Rowley test, which was developed by the Supreme Court. And the second prong of the Rowley test question related to the substantive content of the IEP. IEP essentially saying that the IEP must be reasonably calculated to confer educational benefit. And that educational benefit can only be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So what exactly does that mean? What is educational benefit? Well, special education programs 
according to Rowley decision, do not need to confer maximum educational benefit. But they, and they, neither do they need to deliver the best possible education that we can deliver. But a special ed program that produces what the courts have called minio, minimal, trivial, or de minimis benefit is a violation of fate. Because, again, the Rowley test and later tests uh, develop this whole notion of what is educational benefit. And courts prior to the, uh, following the Rowley decision have really kind of expanded on that. And the term most used in most circuit courts now is meaningful educational benefit. That our IEPs must confer meaningful educational benefit upon students. Benefit, however, can only be determined by ensuring that the goals are meaningful and actually assessing a student's progress toward their IEP goals. And we'll talk, talk more about that later. Edu meaningful educational benefit can really be only assessed, again, on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, these are the, uh, the top substantive errors, so the major substantive errors that school districts make are failing to address problem behavior or any other of the five factors, failing to link assessment to the child's goals and then to the services or the program we offer, failing to write measurable annual goals, failing to develop educationally meaningful programming, and then failing to collect data to show student progress. Now, let's go through these. I'm going to go through these, some, some of these fairly quickly, take a little more time on others. The first error is failing to address the pro, uh, child's problem behavior in the IP or any other of the five factors. Of course, there are five special factors uh, that we must consider in developing a, child, a student's IEP. And those factors are behavior, limited English proficiency, blind, visually impaired, deaf, hearing impaired, and assistive technology. Of these, probably the most important because uh, for us to consider, because they most frequently occur, are considering behavior and then considering assistive technology. To make certain that we do not make this procedural error. Ensure that the IEP team specifically reviews these five special factors as part of the IEP process, which of course includes parental input. This is an especially important issue with respect to a child, to a student's behavior. If a child exhibits problem behavior, Regardless of the child's disability category, if it's emotionally behaviorally disordered or autism or uh, learning disabilities, if there is an indication of problem behavior, clearly that has to be addressed through the IEP process. It has to be addressed in the assessment. In assessment indicates problem behavior. The goals have to address. There has to be a goal addressing problem behavior, a service and uh, as with academic goals, they have to be monitored. Progress toward behavioral goals also has to be monitored. It's, um, the law, of course, says that in the case of a student, and it doesn't say what disability, just says any student with disabilities whose behavior impedes his or her learning makes certain that we consider positive behavioral supports and strategies to address that behavior accent on the positive. There have been a, a couple of due process hearings in which school districts have lost because they have considered behavior, but the behavior plan or the goals, the services that they use were only punishment or behavior reduction, such as um, suspension, um, timeout, things like that. There was no positive way because really what, what Congress wanted when they wrote this section is that we approach problem behavior in a proactive manner and, and concentrate on teaching and skill development to teach appropriate behaviors rather than just punishing students or trying to eliminate uh, problem behavior. Additionally, uh, assistive technology should always be, must always be considered. 
If a child has assistive technology needs, of course, that has to be included in the IEP. Uh, and the IEP team should include a member with behavioral expertise in case of problem behavior, someone who can help the team, guide the team in uh, writing goals, objectives, determining services if a child has problem behavior. Similarly, if a child has assistive technology needs, the IEP team should include a member with expertise in uh, determining assistive, what assistive technology devices or services should be used. That leads us to the eighth major um, problem or error we see in IEP development. And this is a very important one because failing to link a student assessment of a student to the goals that you develop for the student and to the subsequent services that you provide, that is almost that's a surefire way to not provide a fate. And essentially what I mean by that is that our assessments have to be done in an in a appropriate manner. And too often when we do assessments, we only look at issues of eligibility. But in fact, when we do an assessment, we're looking at more than eligibility. We're looking at eligibility plus what instructional services will we be providing to a student. Therefore, the assessments that we do must inform us of and help us make a decision regarding eligibility, but it's also very important that it leads directly to instructional programming, that it be meaningful and relevant to determining what those services that we offer in the IEP look like. Additionally, the assessment also um, includes the progress monitoring. Because in, in essence, the assessment, when a child enters a special education program, is the baseline from which we start, where we write our goals from this baseline, and we monitor a child's progress toward the goals. And these all have to be connected. Assessment must lead to goals, which lead to services, which lead to uh, methods for monitoring progress. Now, too often, as I said, IEP teams focus on the test to determine eligibility without doing assessments that relate meaningful, meaningfully to instruction. Very important. When you're doing those original assessments, you're not just doing those norm reference tests that help us determine eligibility. You're also possibly doing more informal tests, uh, curriculum-based measures, functional behavioral assessments. Those sorts of assessments that relate more in a more meaningful way to instruction than norm reference tests do. Also, very important you include parents in the assessment process and that you request assessments that you believe are important for goals and related services. In other words, any needs that you believe a child has um, or a teacher believes a child has or the parent is concerned about, you need to be assessing in these areas because the law requires a full and individualized assessment of a child's needs. Now, well put in a decision in 2006 in a case out of West Virginia called Kirby v. Cabell County Board of Education where the judge wrote in his opinion, if the IEP team fails to assess the child's present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, the IEP does not comply with the idea. This deficiency goes to the heart of the IEP. The child's level of academic achievement and functional performance is the foundation on which the IEP must be built. Without a clear identification of present levels, the IEP team cannot set measurable goals, evaluate student progress, or determine needed educational service. The, uh, the assessment is the keystone upon which the IEP is, is rests. And that if that is not done appropriately, it's very likely that nothing that follows will be done appropriately. Actually, the Appendix C IDEA regulations in 1997 also uh, in a question and answer document 
the uh, Department of Education stated there should be a direct relationship between the present levels of performance and other components of the IEP. Thus, if the statement describes a problem with a child's reading level and points to a deficiency in reading skills, the problem should be addressed under both goals and specific education and related services provided to a child. So what are some of the things we can do to ensure compliance that we don't make this error? Number one, fully inform parents about the assessments that are going to be conducted and get their written consent. Involve the student's parents in the assessment process. And very important, ensure that the assessments are instructionally relevant, that they will inform the development of the goals, the programming decisions. Again, not just looking at eligibility, but looking at what are the child's needs that need to be addressed in the IEP. And make certain that all needs are identified in the assessment and addressed in the annual goals and services. Now, that leads us to the next major uh, problem we see, or a type of violation, which is failing to develop measurable annual goals. Of course, as I said, uh, and we all understand, the assessment leads us to the goals. And the purpose of a measure, our measurable annual goals is to estimate what a student may accomplish in a year's time and then to evaluate the success of a student's special education program. Now, certain very important characteristics of goals. First, goals must be measurable. We must be able to measure a student's progress toward meeting those goals using, and we'll talk about this in a little while, actual um, data that is measurable. And then we must make sure that we actually measure the goals. Um, as Barbara Bateman said, if a goal is not measurable, it violates the idea and may result in the denial of a fate. If a goal is not measured, that also violates the idea and may result in the denial of a fate. There have been many uh, decisions that have been heard on goals. Uh, one of the, my, I think one of the, the best decisions in terms of the judge making a summary statement about how important goals are was in Rio Rancho Public Schools, which is actually an SEA decision out of New Mexico. Um, and the decision stated, the student's annual goals and objectives in the IEP simply do not contain objective criteria which permit, permit measurement of students' progress. And in this particular case, an IEP was declared to violate fate because the goals were not measurable. The uh, hearing officers went on to say that a goal, which the IEP included goals of increasing, improving and increasing reading comprehension. And the hearing officer wrote, a goal of increasing reading comprehension skills or improving decoding skills is not a measurable goal. Even if the present levels of performance were clearly stated, an open-ended statement that the student will improve does not meet the requirement for a measurable goal. So how, how do we ensure that this is a, a problem that we do not have in our IEPs? Well, one of the things over the last few years I have uh, spent a lot of time on is, is analyzing IEPs from a number of states. And this is a very big problem in IEPs. So, so often, um, goals are not written in ways that are measurable. Well, what can we do to ensure that we do comply with this? Number one, we must look at that assessment in the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance and make certain that every need that we identify, every instructional or functional need that we've identified in those present level statements has a goal. And furthermore, these goals must be specific, they must be clear, and they must be measurable. Improve to improve, Johnny will improve, or Johnny will increase skills is not a measurable goal. It must be written in a way that someone can actually measure progress from the assessment 
to the end of the year or on a more frequent basis, which we'll talk about, and truly measure a goal. Now, the goal section of the IEP must also contain information on how the student's progress will be measured, and furthermore, how progress will be communicated to the student's parents. So, in the very important thing here is we must write measurable goals, and we must actually measure those goals. And that leads us to the next major problem, which is AR10, failing to develop um, meaningfully uh, edu or educationally meaningful programming. Uh, the programming requirements uh, are consist of special ed services that we provide, the related services, the supplementary services, and the program modifications. And as you all know, in 2004, this was the section on peer-reviewed research was added. Special education services, related services, supplementary services, and program modifications must now be based on peer-reviewed research to the um, extent practicable. And what does that mean? Well, the Department of Education has essentially said extent practicable means if there's research, you have to use it. Uh, we've actually had some due process hearings heard on this question of IEPs, special ed services being based on peer-reviewed research. Uh, there was a decision out of Iowa in which the school district was found to have violated the uh, FAPE requirement because they did not use, use research-based services or their special ed services were not based on the research. In fact, they were actually counter to what the research was saying. And that decision was ultimately upheld at a district court level. So there have been a few cases. This is an area in which, it, which is so new in a legal sense since 2004 that a lot of cases haven't gone to due process or we haven't heard it, certainly the district court. Um, but nonetheless, it's very important to realize special ed services must be based on peer-reviewed research. What does that mean? Well, according to the idea, or, or Congress and the Department of Education, what that means is our services must be based on what works, on what peer-reviewed journals have found to be research-based strategies or strategies that work in, in teaching reading or behavioral programming or whatever. Or we can use uh, strategies that have been approved by an independent panel of ex experts. And the final analysis, of course, is our programs must be designed to confer meaningful educational benefit. So what can we do to make certain that we comply with these programming requirements? Well, number one, programming decisions must be individualized. They're based on the needs of the students, not the availability of services. Our measurable goals must be based on meaningful assessments, and moreover, they must be ambitious. No school district has ever lost a FAPE case in a due process hearing or in a court because the goals were too ambitious. They have frequently, often, more often lost because the goals were not ambitious enough. And the courts decided that, well, if the student makes this goal, it really will not benefit. It will not benefit the child because it's not a meaningful goal. So in writing goals, you want to be reasonable, but you really should err on the side of ambition. Also, services in the IEP must be based on peer-reviewed research. And whatever services we include in the IEP must be delivered as specified. So in that sense, an IEP is like a contract. If we've said in the IEP this is what we're going to do, of course, we have to do it. Eleventh major error. And I would guess probably um, right along with the measurable annual goals, this is the substantive error that is most frequently committed by school districts, and that is failing to collect data on student progress. Legal requirements state that we must measure a student's progress toward each of his or her goals frequently in a frequent and systematic manner. And we have to report a student's progress to his or her parents. And therefore, the IEP 
in addition to having write, written our measurable annual goals, we also say this is how we're going to measure a student's progress and this is how we're going to report a student's progress to his or her parents. With a clear implication of that, if we measure progress, is if we find a student is not making progress, is we have to revise the IEP some, in some way, revise a child's instruction, and then continue to monitor progress. Good decision out of New York essentially said this was a case in which uh, school district's IEP was declared uh, to violate fate because no attempt to measure student's progress was made. The court wrote, periodic review of progress on the goals and objectives provides the disabled student's teacher with supporting data needed to make a determination of the success of the intervention. Furthermore, um, subjective data is not real data. As a court said in, in Rhinebeck Central School District, Although a subjective teacher observation provides valuable information, teacher observation is not an adequate method of monitoring student progress. Because without supporting data, teacher observation is opinion which cannot be verified. And one big caution was it, that we must give here is in the misuse of percentages. Uh, Barbara Bateman has said that one of the biggest uh, disservices to special education was when somebody decided that just by putting a percentage in a, in a goal, you make it measurable. Of course, this is not true at all. Uh, another decision, Rio Rancho Public Schools, IEP was thrown out when the annual goals were determined not to be measurable. And one of the reasons was that the annual goals contained percentages of accuracy that were not helpful. That is, the IEP failed to define where the students started and where they would end. Therefore, to say 80% and they would achieve 80% accuracy when the IEP did not say what the beginning point was or the ending point was, according to the Rio Rancho Public School decision, was a violation of the idea because percentages by themselves are meaningless. Now, how can we ensure that we don't violate the uh, data section of the IEP? Make certain we include a method of monitoring progress and the schedule and format for reporting to a child's parents in the IEP. Again, you have to make sure those goals are measurable and then actually measure them. You need to collect real data, not which the courts seem to have been saying really are numbers, not so much words. Remember, teacher opinion is very can be very important, but at the end, in a measure, in if in a due process hearing, opinion is just opinion, and it's not real data. We have to also make um, program adjustments if needed. Now. Um, if there's any one thing that I think we can do to bulletproof our IEPs is make certain that we write measurable goals and actually measure them, actually be able to show that we uh, that our student that a student is making progress toward his or her goals. That requires collecting some sort of data. Now, how do we make certain or ensure that we avoid all these potholes, all these legal IEP errors, well, of course, we have to make certain that all staff understand the procedural and substantive requirements of the idea. Know what the law requires. The law ch is cha changes quite frequently. There's cases that are constant, constantly being heard that can inform us about certain issues in law. We need to keep current on legal legal developments. So it's really important when the idea changes, which it will in a few years when it's going to be reauthorized, that we provide professional development activities on the ideas requirements for teachers and for administrators. We have to ensure meaningful parental involvement. The IEP expressly contemplates parents are going to act as advocates for their children at every stage 
of the special education process, and we have to ensure that they are meaningfully involved. Third, make certain that we develop measurable annual goals. We have to do an assessment that addresses all those areas of need, and then we have to actually measure a child's progress toward those goals. Can't do that unless the goals are written in ways that are measurable. And monitor student progress. Now, as OSEP's Center on Progress Monitoring said, is that um, progress monitoring is a scientifically based practice that is used to assess students' academic and functional performance and evaluate the effectiveness of instruction. Again, if there's any one way to bulletproof a school district's IEP, it's to make sure, certain that you've written measurable goals and you actually monitor student progress and show student progress in the data that you collect. That is, real quickly, um, a synopsis of the major errors uh, that we see in IEP development. And of course, can't stress enough that the IEP is the fate for a child. It is, a free, it is the blueprint of a free, appropriate public education. And um, we need to ensure that we write IEPs that are educationally meaningful and legally sound in avoiding those major errors and really concentrating on parental involvement, on, on the whole assessment, goals, services, progress monitoring component will help to ensure that our IEPs do really benefit children and they are written in a way that, that is legally correct. So that is about an hour up. I think we have a little extra time if people wanted to uh, just had any questions or things they want to bring up. Again, this um, thanks so much to the Indiana IEP Resource Center, um, Jolly Matt and Elisa and everyone, and this will be uh, posted on on the web page. So if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, just type them in. Also, of course, you could always um, uh, write to the IEP Resource Center, send an email, and you know you'll always get a good answer that way. So uh, no comments or questions, so thank you very much for participating. Oh, wait, we do have one. Do you consider lack of homework completion a behavioral issue, a parenting issue, and should it be addressed in the IEP? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, if that is a major behavioral problem, of course, that could be addressed in the IEP. More than likely, not in the goals, but uh, possibly in the service statements or the program modifications to, to help a child. Um, certainly, it could be a parenting issue, but as educators, of course, we have no ability to write anything that directs parents to do anything in the IEP, so it probably would be addressed as a supplementary or a program modification. Peer-reviewed research, boy, that's a whole, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that. It's a, a very complicated issue. Um, Peer-reviewed research, <coughs> excuse me, in the idea, Congress actually didn't define what peer-reviewed research was. Instead, they said it's defined in uh, it's defined in No Child Left Behind, and No Child Left Behind says that reading and math programs must be based on scientifically uh, based instruction. And one component of scientifically based instruction is that research has been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, or approved by an independent panel of experts. And that essentially is the way peer-reviewed research is defined. No further definition is offered. Um, there are many websites and uh, that are linked to the Department of Education uh, that do have peer-reviewed research on them. But that's really, I think, going to be in the final analysis um, something schools and school districts and uh, states are going to have to do. They're going to have to offer uh, uh, 
programming or in-service development, personnel development to teachers because there's so much research out there and it's increasing so much. Uh, it's, this is something that we're going to be hearing in the courts in the due process, I would say, in a few years. Um, another interesting question, what if uh, the parents are capable, I guess, uh, oh, students are capable but refuse, therefore they won't meet their goals and the parents won't reinforce it. That is certainly a tough issue, um, but what, what our responsibility is, is to involve the parents to the extent that we can, document it if we can't, uh, write meaningful goals and measure progress, but the IEP is not a guarantee of progress. It's a guarantee of we're going to make good faith efforts uh, to educate a child. Um, what is a reasonable num uh, number of attempts at notification? No good answer for that. You know, you just make the best efforts you can.